I said, empty your mind. Be formless, shapeless, like water. It's about how hard you hit. It's about how hard you can get hit and keep moving forward. How much you can take and keep moving forward. Join movement expert Aaron Alexander as he dives into the minds of the foremost innovative healthcare thinkers on their approach to optimal health and wellness. Align Podcast. Welcome back to Align Podcast. My name is Aaron Alexander. In today's tremendous episode, got to have my friend and one of my favorite thinkers in the world, Dr. Chris Ryan, on the podcast for, I think it might just be the second time. The first time, I believe, was darn near almost four years ago, three and a half years ago or so. And um, yeah, it's been a while. So really grateful to have had him back in this conversation. We get into his upcoming book, Civilized to Death, concepts of anti-fragility, what the heck that means, and some of the impacts that modernity has had on our minds and on our bodies. And uh, it's really good. I hope you guys take this stuff. Chris truly is one of my favorite thinkers in the world. So I um, hope you guys enjoy. Thanks so much for tuning in to the website, alignpodcast.com, A-L-I-G-N podcast. Dot com. Uh, on there, you start the five-day moon challenge. I am really proud of that thing. Uh, it's five really simple videos, a couple minutes a piece, really well done. And um, yeah, I'm, I'm really proud of those guys. So hope you check that out. Hope you enjoy it. And I hope it is helpful for you. Linepodcast.com. You can start that thing. Uh, thank you so much to our sponsor, Ned for supporting this podcast. Ned is some of the highest quality CBD oil you'll find on the market. Um, There are so many of them and um, they do a really good job. It's all cold extracted. Um, They are uh, come from a single source in Colorado. The people that put it together are rad. I really appreciate what they're doing over there. So you can get yourself 15% off by using the align code. You can go to helloned.com slash align. Hello, Ned.com slash online, and uh, you get 15% off on that stuff. I enjoy enjoy using these oils. Um, I think that's good. Just got back from Texas, and thank you so much to folks that came out for the, uh, the workshop that I put on out there, and thanks so much for the folks that came up and said hi and all that stuff. It, it's so fun to get to see the people. <clears throat> so thanks for, thanks for saying what's up. All right, here we go. Back to... The podcast with Dr. Chris Ryan. Pow. Align podcast. Is that a butt plug over there? Oh, where are that? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, no, on I the have floor. a butt plug. <laughs> Did you leave your oh, butt plug guy. out? <laughs> yeah, no. I'm joking. I'm no, joking. I have a prostate massager. Oh yeah. Yeah, that's that's. Uh, What's his name? That's, uh, I haven't named it yet. I have Rex. It hit, I keep it hidden from the, the cleaners. <laughs> Just joking, I don't have cleaners. <laughs> God help me if I ever had a cleaning lady. She'd have to be blind, which would be great for a cleaning lady, probably. Yeah, that would be All right, sorry, I fucked up your intro there. No, it's okay. That was the intro. Oh, okay. Yeah, you know, we're in it. Uh-huh. Um, but yeah, so anyway, so that's, that's uh, in relation to this, that's something I think would be great to, one of the, the chapters I'm going to write about, like, uh, come up this morning of have like um robust roger and collapsed carl and kind of have like the the paleo man mm-hmm. the need to go outside and expose himself to sunlight and mm. dance and sing and mm. just you know have to hunt and be hunted and all that and how that the, the body thrives on that adaptation mm. and now collapsed carl i don't know if they're actually gonna call that um we just we've protected ourselves from all of that and now our body's like bored and wigging out and mm. depressed and fat mm. so anyways so that's in relation to the book stuff and you i think that would be great to have that in there i, I was just thinking about uh, a photography exhibition i went to in san diego a year or so ago it was uh sebastian salgado it's one of my favorite photographers and the photograph was uh probably about a dozen shaman from the Amazon that somehow he got all together in one room. It's a phenomenal photograph. It's probably online somewhere. Salgado shamans. And uh, it was interesting because they're probably all in their 70s. They look to be pretty old dudes. And every one of them is just totally badass in a unique way. You look in their faces and everyone is just like not a guy you would ever want to fuck with. But their bodies were not the sort of super fit um, 
you know, bodies that we imagine in prehistory. And, and quite a bit of hunter-gatherers I've seen, they've got guts, some of them. You know, they got a bit of a gut and they got a little flab. So I think there, there is a level of fitness, cardiovascular fitness, and certainly uh, immunological fitness in prehistory and in hunter-gatherers, modern-day hunter-gatherers. Um, but I don't know that it necessarily looks like what we associate with fitness right now in the West. That sort of, you know, hyper uh, toned, very muscular kind of like you. I don't I don't know that you probably still would have been unusual in prehistory as a body type. Yeah, if I was in the jungle or in the woods, which I don't do like weightlifting. Mm. Everything that I do is like people lifting and crawling around the ground and surfing and stuff right, like that. Right. Um, but even still, if I was actually to survive in the woods or the jungle, yeah, I would have to slender up. Right. Cause you would take in too many, you need too, too many calories. Food. Yeah. For the muscle it's mass. Yeah. 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 It's interesting when we come to the U S my wife, Casilda, not you, but like the hyper American, like super upper bodies, you know, kind of workout guys. Yep. Uh, she calls them lobsters. Mm -hmm. She says there are lobsters yeah. everywhere. Yeah. Big, stiff, uh, you know, not, not flexible. And it's all just like, you know, unbalanced muscular development. Yeah. Yeah. How's the journey been on working on the, on your book? Uh, I'm done with it. Essentially. Cool. I'm doing the last pass, uh, starting any day now. And I turn it in early January right. for the final, I mean, they've already approved it and accepted it and all that. So now I'm just like this is your last chance to add anything, change anything, and then and then it goes to copy editing and all that. How has it formed your perception on humanity? Doing all the research and kind of forming a storyline and everything. Uh, well, it it led me to a couple of insights that I ended up not being able to really incorporate into this book because they were so far-reaching that. I, I did in the first draft, one of the reasons it's taken a lot of time is that I came out, I, I sort of saw this idea and I went with it. And then when I turned in the manuscript, my editor said, you have like the first half of two different books here. Right. So I recommend you take that stuff, pull it out and, you know, use that as the first half of your next book and then finish this book, you know, which was good advice. So... Um, because this book is about, is essentially arguing that, um, civilization is not such a clear, has not conferred clear benefits on human beings, hmm. which a lot of people find deeply counterintuitive. Like that's absurd. How could you possibly say that? We have antibiotics, we have airplanes, we have seatbelts, we have, you know, all this great stuff. But when you look at the entire package of what civilization has given along with what it's taken, see, we never talk about what it's taken away from us. Like your, sounds like your book's going to be doing that. And more and more people are starting to think about those things. But until very recently, nobody thought about those things. It was all just, you know, if you say someone changed the world, it was just always assumed for the better. Right. So and so changed the world. Oh, good for him. Well, you know, give him a Nobel Prize. Well, a lot of changes aren't for the better. A lot of changes are negative. A lot of what we call progress is just the advancing of negative trends. Right. You know, our health has gotten worse and worse and worse. Uh, depending when you look at it. if you compare it to medieval times. No. But if you compare it certainly to our sort of baseline hunter gatherer, um, health status, nutrition, health, anxiety, relationship quality, the presence of the li likelihood of being affected by violence, infectious diseases, you know, loneliness, despair, suicide, depression, all these things are the results of civilization. And so, sure, you can look at heart transplants and, you know, the cure for various infectious diseases and see great benefit in that. But on the other hand, you have to say, well, people in prehistory were very unlikely to need a heart transplant, right? Right. Cause their cardiovascular health was much better. They didn't need antibiotics because infectious diseases were a non-issue. None of those things really became issues until we were in highly, um, densely populated, stable, 
um, settlements. You know, hunter gatherers don't have tuberculosis or um, you know influenza or any of these other diseases that spread across populations. And most of those diseases, uh, influenza, tuberculosis, smallpox, all these major killers of human beings, jumped over from domesticated animals when when agriculture first started and people were living together with these animals. Um, before then, those viruses and bacteria didn't adapt to humans. So this argument of like, oh, but, you know, civilization has solved so many problems. People don't realize that the vast majority of those problems were created by civilization. And the problem in the first place, what we conceive as being a problem, was actually what allows our, our nervous system, our biology, to adapt and to grow. You're talking about parasites and, and the immunological response to things? That, but I'm looking at from like a movement perspective. Of oh, like, for right. example, like we just <clears throat> chop down the jungle and just create a, a paved path. Mm. Whereas as you were getting moved by the jungle and stepping on that route and being alert of the potential poisonous fill in the blank thing. Now it's like, okay, we'll kill all the poisonous things. We'll flatten everything out. So now you don't actually need to go through any of these movements. Mm. And then, you know, I think our bodies end up kind of like yeah. bored, bored. Sure. And, and when the immune system is bored, it turns on itself and you get autoimmune disorders. Yeah. You know, that's the sort of, theory underlying uh, helminth therapy and uh, you know introducing intentionally introducing parasites to the body because mm. that appears to solve autoimmune disorders a lot of them uh, when you introduce worms uh, particular types of worms flatworms hookworms mm. often solve issues like uh, MS and uh, I forget Crohn's disease and some of the other very common yeah. autoimmune disorders yeah, I mean, along those lines with the, the body getting bored and all that, I had an experience a couple of years ago now that I think about a lot in these terms. I was reading a book called, uh, do you need to do something with that? No, that was my music player that no one would have heard here, so my life oh, seemed very oh, strange okay. and random. <laughs> There's, um, yeah. My music player just shut off. Uh, yeah. uh, <laughs> with, a, with a sigh. Uh, so I was reading this book called... Um, Anti-Fragile by um, Nassim Talib. Yeah. yeah. And the idea of the book is very simple. It's, it's if I ask you to imagine something that's fragile, you might ma imagine a um, champagne glass in a wooden box. You shake the box, it shatters, right? So that's fragility. And now if I ask you to imagine the opposite of that, you'll probably imagine a rock, in the box, you shake the box, nothing happens. The rock's fine, right? But his point is that that is not, in fact, the opposite. Yep. The opposite is something you put in the box, you shake the box, and it gets stronger, right? Not no change. It gets stronger from the stress. And if you look around, what gets stronger from stress? Muscles, relationships, good relationships, um, immunological system, right? Emotional health. Emotional health, families, dynamics, community, all these things actually grow because of stress. They need stress in order to grow. Right. Back to your point about walking through a forest versus, you know, riding a golf cart across a parking lot. So, you know, I started applying that to lots of different things in life. And one night I was staying with friends and they, I was staying in their guest house and they said, uh, yeah, let me know what you think of the bed because we just replaced the mattress with this really expensive, super, super duper natural latex harvested from fucking organic jungles somewhere. You know, they have money. So, so they bought this $10,000 mattress, right? And so that night, I, you know, whatever, I checked my email, I took a shower, I went to bed, I went out of breakfast the next morning and they said, what'd you think of that mattress? And I thought, fuck, I forgot all about it. You know, I lay down, I fell asleep and I guess it was great, you know. But then in terms of the book, I was thinking, well, OK, my experience was my experience was the rock. My experience was that I felt no discomfort. And generally, that's what we consider to be comfort, the absence of discomfort. Yeah. But in fact... If you think like, okay, that spectrum from champagne glass to rock, that's only half the spectrum. So what's the rest of the spectrum? What is true comfort? True comfort is 
you know, I think of when I was in Alaska and it was like a freezing rain and I was backpacking and I got out my tent and I set up my tent and I stripped off my clothes and I dive in my tent and I've got a towel and I towel off and, and I crawl in my down sleeping bag and I've got my little candle lantern and I've got a bottle of wine and some nuts and cheese and a little music and it's fucking pouring rain a foot away from my head and I, it's raging against that little tent and I'm dry and warm and I got my food. I got a joint to smoke. I'm like totally hooked up, right? That's fucking comfort right there. Not the absence of discomfort, right? Actually, you need discomfort in order to experience true comfort. So that got, I mean, I, that, I just think about that all the time. And it's, it's kind of a simple insight, but it relates to what you're saying where we live in this society that has attempted with great success to remove discomforts, to remove irritants, to remove every possible danger. And in so doing has eliminated half of the spectrum of human experience, which happens to be the half that promotes growth and strength and, and vigor. And so we wonder why we're depressed. We wonder why we're suicidal. We wonder why we're unhealthy. It's because we don't do anything. We're not, we're not, we're not fighting against anything. We're not overcoming anything. Yeah. You know, I find it really interesting going to gyms, um, because what we've done, because we've imbalanced ourselves with that by ameliorating everything and making everything more efficient and easier and more accessible. Now we, we have to at some point we have to do work in order for our bodies to function. And now we call it like working out right. or exercise. Yeah. You know, and so you go and I, I'm, I was, I was at the gym today and I'm like carrying kettlebells around and doing like this, you know, whatever random, I'm like rolling around the ground, you know, random stuff. Um, but I'm like, God, I should be building a house right now. This is such bullshit. It's a total waste of energy. <laughs> it's a total waste You're running of on a fucking hamster wheel <laughs> in a cage. I know. I don't go to gyms, man. I can't do it. I don't like, I don't understand well, I do it for the drug effect. I do it because it makes you, me feel you get high. I don't, I've never, <laughs> never had a runner's high in my life. Dude, I don't get any kind of good buzz from working out. I don't get, I don't feel bad when I don't work out. Like some people are like, Oh, I feel horrible. I'm like, I just, I'm in a hammock. I feel great. Right. Yeah. I mean, I, I guess, I guess it would be good if I felt bad when I didn't work out, but I'm not in favor of feeling bad. So yeah. I get that with uh, the motorcycle as well. Mm. Like people said, like the first thing that everyone says, first thing you said to me was, it was like, Oh, well it's dangerous. And I'm like, I, I know, I know it's dangerous. Yeah. Um, but my counter to that is that a car is, is guaranteed danger. You know, unless you reshape things and you kind of incorporate some movement into it. But with the car, it's like taking a safe job when you're 18. Oh, you're right, like, cool, right. making 40,000 a year. Right. So great. I'm like way better than you guys. Meanwhile, your friends like surfing and doing art and like having sex and like, right. exploring themselves. Yeah. 10 years later, Look at the person that was hunched over in the depressed, folded over position versus the person that's vigilant and aware and skidding their feet across the yeah. ground and like their mm. senses are coming on. Right. Yeah. Unless a deer ran out in front of them, if in you which die, case, yeah, yeah. the creative venture, you might die. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and, and that relates, I mean, you're right. That relates to, to this book I just finished because, you know, the, I had to, to be honest about like, what is the major benefit of civilization? The major benefit that I will freely acknowledge is that far fewer babies die mm. as a percentage, uh, not as an absolute number, but as a percentage of population, um, you know, somewhere depending on the group, somewhere between 20 and 40% of infants die before they're three or four years old right? Or under five, I guess. Um, that's a lot, right? And so if everybody rode motorcycles, a lot of people would die on motorcycles. But the ones who don't die, as you say, they would be much more awake, much more aware, yeah. have a lot more fun. Uh, and, you know, I rode a motorcycle every day for seven years. And yeah, I know it, it makes you feel alive because you are in the presence of extreme danger yeah. like you're fucking flying down the road at 120 kilometers an hour you're you smell everything you're watching everything every little movement on the side of the road you're monitoring it it's 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 great it's a great state of consciousness i love it mm. I fucking miss it yeah 
Yeah, BMW loved it. What kind was it? K seventy five, seven hundred and fifty. Seven fifty, cool. Yeah, three cylinders, liquid cooled, just the smoothest. I mean, it's not like a cool. It's you have an Indian or something or Triumph or. It's a Triumph. Yeah, it's a, yeah. yeah it's, it's not like that. It's not like you know a Harley or like a Mister Cool. It's just like, it's like the kind of motorcycle a dentist would buy. You know, <laughs> <laughs> super safe, low center of gravity, totally smooth. You know, acceleration just, boom, just takes off. Is I love it. Did you ever do any, windscreen? Did you ever do any like traveling motorcycle trips? Oh yeah, I drove up cool. to France a bunch of times. Oh, I was right. in Barcelona. Yeah, okay. I rode it down to Sevilla. Uh, and actually, I took it to, to Seville on the train, and then I rode from Seville up to Lisbon along the Portuguese coast. That was the trip where I met Casilda. And then I rode it uh, where I rode it to Madrid, I think, from there, and then put it back on the train. Hmm. Yeah, I, I put in probably 50,000 kilometers on that thing. Hmm. I loved it. And I had bikes in the U.S. too. Why but, do you get rid of it? Why, why not have a bike now? Uh, I got rid of it because I almost died on it. Oh, actually yeah. and yeah. um i was with casilda and when i was when i was on my own i didn't really care because i mean it would have sucked for my parents of course but i didn't have kids and you know it was like hey it's my life uh, and but then i was with cassie and she had moved to barcelona to be with me and um yeah we went out on a saturday night to see a buddy of mine play. He was a jazz musician. I normally never rode the motorcycle on weekend nights because of all the drunks out. But I made an exception. And yeah, I mean, it, people can't see, so it's hard to describe it. But I, a guy pulled right in front of us. There was an open parking spot, and he was trying to get into that parking spot. And somehow he didn't see us coming. Headlight, you know, we were behind a pack of cars. Yeah. And he just pulled in and I had to maneuver like he stopped. I couldn't go to the left. So I had to go between him and the car into the parking space and then out of the parking space. And there was like, luckily she melted into my back. So there yeah, was no, no movement. And I just, and I got off, I, I stopped the bike and I got off and I was like, I was wearing a leather jacket. I had gloves, a helmet, and I was going to just beat this guy to pieces you know i'm not violent but i was like first of all i'm armored and you almost killed me and my woman and i'm gonna just beat you to fucking pulp yep. and he got out of his car and dropped to his knees and just said please please i'm sorry i'm sorry i'm sorry I'm like fuck <laughs> fuck man <laughs> i can't punch a dude on his knees yeah but i was so full of adrenaline you know and after that, it's like, come on. All right, now, if she dies, she's a doctor. She's, there are a lot of people whose lives aren't going to be saved. And then her, she has a daughter, you know, a little girl. She's going to lose her mother. And like, and no, I keep it as okay. like, a, like a joy maker. So I don't use it all the time. Like you said, I'm going to drive a fucking Prius. Right. You know, so it's like the opposite end right. of the spectrum. Right. <laughs> so the yeah. Prius is like the yin, you know, like, okay, I'm going to get the groceries. And I'm like, this is like the real, you know, me. And then there's the other side. It's like, it's just... Something that I think people lack in modernity is is joy. Like we're just, you know, we're in the tunnel and it's like pay the rent or get the thing or, you know, power or money or whatever it may be. Right. And you miss just genuine visceral joy. Yeah. You know, so for me getting on the motorcycle, I get this like every time I, 100%, I get on, I literally like, it's like embarrassing. I have like a little like schoolgirl laugh. <laughs> where right. I'm like, oh, like, yeah. oh. Yeah. You know, and I think that it's if, fun. you know, we... But that, it doesn't need to be a motorcycle. It could be anything. Yeah, I mean, at this point, I I had a motorcycle then because I needed it for work. Uh, I needed to get around, and I there was no way to... Cars in Barcelona are a nightmare. Um, I could have had a little Vespa or something, but I wanted a bike because I wanted to go up in the mountains and take yeah. off and stuff. Um, but at this point, I try to do things that that confer that joy that feel dangerous, but actually aren't, yep. you know? So I ch I'm always looking at the, the uh, cost benefit ratio of things. And there are a lot of things that you can do that feel really dangerous and give your body that like, Oh, will I survive this? You know, but then you're not going to actually get hurt like rock climbing or something. If you're roped in, you know, mm. scuba diving, your body can't believe you're going to be able to breathe 
underwater. You know, there's like a physiological incomprehension until you do it. And then it's incredibly peaceful and beautiful. Have you done that scuba diving? Yeah. 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 I'm yeah. like patty certified, but I've yeah. probably had like six dives. I essentially dove enough to get patty certified. That's, that's what I did. And then I snorkel the rest of the time. <laughs> yeah. It's like everything cools in the first 20 feet anyway. Yeah. Right. So. Actually, I did go down to the, the cenotes in, um, in oh, in the Tulum. Yukatan. Yeah. yeah. And that yeah. was pretty dope. I'll bet. Yeah. That I was really cool. That. Actually. I, I was diving off, uh, was it Isla Mujeres mm. uh, a long time ago near Cancun? Uh, but I didn't go to the cenotes. I, I bet the visibility is amazing. Yeah, and then you go through the, I, I forget what it's called. It's something probably with the word sol in it for salt. Sol media, I don't know. When, when the salt water meets the fresh water. Uh, sol line or something. But uh, you go through and it's full on a psychedelic experience. Huh? Because when you go through that, it's like your goggles, everything just goes and just twists and you can go in and out of it and you can see the clear water and so you can just like volunteer yourself to go into this thing and the whole world go Poof, like it's a another fish like in a, a starry night painting or something oh. um probably i don't remember fish hmm. no in the cenote is not really there's no yeah. fish it's pretty dead it's like yeah a it's cave. just yeah 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 it's a good experience though just having those moments of feeling kind of like just i, I think that one we have an unhealthy attachment to life um, and so that kind of a, like veers us away from anything that gets us close to death. Yeah. But yeah. And that it's like the whole paradise made hell thing. Like it's a great, it's a great line. Yeah. An unhealthy attachment to life. That's good. <laughs> I might steal that shit. It's all yours. <laughs> Cause the, this book civilized to death that I just finished. Uh, that's essentially the thesis that we are civilization is a, a giant edifice that we've constructed to distract ourselves from our mortality right that's the the whole point of it it's this giant fucking super organism that we've embedded ourselves in and you know we've allowed ourselves to become domesticated because the trade off is it's safer in the zoo yeah. we're, we're safer in our cages it's safe from what is the question nobody really seems to be asking you know so um but yeah a lot of a lot of what fuels it in my opinion is this unhealthy attachment to life and aversion to death. And so the idea, you know, getting back to the infant mortality um, question, yeah, there's a lot of infant mortality in prehistory, but the people who live, live really well. Yep. So why, how does it, how do we argue, how does anyone argue that it makes sense for all of us to live lower quality lives so that more of us can survive. Why does that matter? The only way that makes sense is if being dead is horribly painful and suffering, right? That's the only way it makes sense that we should all sacrifice 20% of our quality of life so that those, you know, that four week old infant doesn't die. Because, oh, the, it'll suffer, you know, eternal damnation in hell, the fires of hell or something. If you believe that death is eternal suffering, then, yeah, it's to be avoided at all costs. But if you believe that death is just the absence of anything, you know, pleasure or pain, then why would you pay anything for someone to avoid it? doesn't matter, mm. right? It's, it's over. So four out of you know, 50 kids die. Well, okay. It's sad for their parents. It's sad for, you know, but they're dead. So who cares? I mean, I don't, that probably sounds brutal, but from a purely mathematical sort of logical perspective, this avoidance of death makes no sense. Well, it's kind of selfish. It's like, Oh, they're dead. It's like, well, you don't care about them being dead. You care about being bummed that they're dead. Yeah. <laughs> it's not yeah. about them. Right. Exactly. <laughs> they're, they're, they're out. Stoked. They're stoked. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <I'm> stoked. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's a weird thing. I mean, Mark Twain had this great line about how I don't understand why everyone's so afraid of dying because no one seems to complain about how terrible things were before they were born. And it's the same thing. It's the same state. When you're, you're after life and before life, you're in the same place, wherever that is. And nobody, you know, no babies are running around going, thank God you got me out of there. You know, it was terrible. Yeah. No, it seems 
the absence of suffering is where we come from and where we go. So what's the fucking problem? Yeah. Alan Watts talks about like the, the, the relief of like death, you know, it's like, Oh, it's like, you don't have to pay all your fucking taxes. Like you don't got to shave your armpits anymore or yeah. whatever you're into. If you're a girl, shave your armpits. I don't know. We do weird oh. shit. Shave your legs. You got to like stay maintained. <laughs> 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 it's a little you're, work. you're a hairier guy than I am, right? I don't, I don't think about that as much. I don't shave my arm. But, well, no, that's not true. I have. <laughs> <laughs> so that is a butt plug over there, then. Huh? Uh, yeah, I yeah. Think if you can have that acceptance of of death as being almost a relief, yeah. it's not going to make you suicidal, but it'll no. make you really actually perhaps be able to like enjoy the moment even more, as opposed it'll, to living in fear. It'll certainly change the way you look at student loans. <laughs> or any loans. All right. I mean, it, it seems like the whole debt system is built on the idea that nobody thinks they're going to die. Right. But if I, if I'm like 75 and someone will lend me half a million dollars, <laughs> I mean, sure. yeah, I'll, I'll take that. What's the interest rate? I don't give a shit. That's the interest rate. <laughs> I don't fucking care. Yeah. Student loans. See you later. You yeah. were forced to have a happy ending on your book, from my understanding, from what you said, or maybe not forced, or maybe that naturally no. happened that way, or something. No, no, I mean, just, just they, you know, publishers want upbeat endings to all books, right? Yeah. What's the takeaway? Yeah. What's the takeaway? Yeah. yeah what are the five easy steps to <laughs> eternal happiness? Oh, yeah. Let me let me write that chapter for you. Yeah, right. I've got five steps in my book. Do you? <laughs> <laughs> Five. It's so much more than that, though. <laughs> but there are five things that I think are. What, what's your book called? The provisional title? Uh, well, it, it'll potentially change with the Align Method, and so it's, method. and so. But the five steps are like five <laughs> things that I think that essentially like how to be more hunter gatherer and throughout your day. So it's like spending more time on the mm. floor, right? Each day, no big deal. Um, Hammocks, hammocks. Yeah, absolutely. Beds I, are crazy. Everything. I think the hammock is the first and best human invention. Yeah, great space. It's it's comfortable. It's the perfect position for circulation. Your feet are at the same height as your head, yep. so you're you're balanced. Uh, it it the pre, there's no pressure points. It's universally, you know, the the uh, the points where of support yeah, distribution. are distributed perfectly. Babies love them. There's yep. movement, and you swing a baby in a hammock. Oh my god, they love them. Cats love them. I used to have hammocks hammocks for my cats. Um, and the reason I think it's the first human invention is that uh, chimpanzees and bonobos both sleep in hammocks. Yep. They, they weave hammocks out of branches. Right. So I think it's, it's a pre-human invention, in fact. Mm. And that's another part of the, so that's another one of the steps is that you need to hang each day because we're all mm. fucking apes. Mm. Or at least we're stemmed from that if you believe in evolution or whatever. Like our shoulders are built to hang. If you believe in evolution. <laughs> I don't know. There might be two people listening to this that are like nope evolutions don't buy it nope <laughs> don't buy it yeah good luck people <laughs> but you can incorporate simple things into your day to day that really truly do like it is medicinal you could say throughout the day um, as opposed to kind of like backloading all of your fitness into this little container you call Tybo or some whatever. yeah 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 and work make more work I, I have a uh, book on the back shelf that's health related and a lot of it is about um sort of questioning this american uh devotion to work hmm. you know i'm i've never been into it that's why i live in spain my whole life my, most of my adult life yeah because i got there and i was like oh this is a culture that actually makes sense to me america never made sense to me all this fucking working yeah Waitress comes up to me at a restaurant. Are you still working on that salad? Fuck no. I'm trying to eat it. I'm not working on my salad, woman. Jesus. No. And I'm not going to the gym to work out. Right? And I, I, mean, I want to have a marriage that I have to work on. If I have to work on your marriage, maybe you're married to the wrong fucking person. You know? Mm. So, yeah, I have a very bohemian approach to life. If If it's... Something feels good because it's good. You know, if you refine your uh, your ability to hear the voice, the voice of your own intuition and the voice of your body and your spirit and your soul or whatever it is you imagine speaks to you. If you can hear that voice 
under the din of the voice of the culture and the advertisements and the ego and all the stuff coming at you telling you to buy more stuff and, you know, be prettier and, you know, whatever. If you can ignore all that and actually hear the voice that's coming from within, I think that that voice guides you pretty uh, flawlessly to a life that is more pleasurable and enriching and meaningful. And that shouldn't be work. That should be joyful. As you say, there should be joy. Yeah. And there, there's a reason these things feel good, because they are good. You've been actually a helpful reflection for me with that of, um, you know, where I'm, I have, I mean, I think it's pretty apparent that I have all sorts of, like, throughout my life into the present, all sorts of, like, insecurities and, like, seeking validation and, and things of that nature. And so, like, creating wealth or creating, you know, a, a business or what, what have you, those are all like potential, potentially just feeding into that. Like I'm validated mm. because I did this thing. Right. You know, and I, I think it's so important to like, I'm almost envious in some ways. And I think I'm kind of like scraping at it of people that really can feel satiated. Mm. You know, it's like in the realm of hungry ghosts. God, mm, God, I got know. an email from him today, actually. Oh, cool. Yeah. Yeah. What about? Oh, uh, no, no, it wasn't. I was, plug stuff. I was just, <laughs> I was just introducing him to a guy named Pete Evans, uh, an Australian chef who has a podcast, okay. um, that I was on a while ago and, and Pete's a TV personality in Australia. I don't know if you have Australian listeners, but yeah, we definitely do. he's a cool, yeah. he's a cool guy. And I did his podcast and he's very interested in psychedelics and, um, addiction and all that kind of stuff. And he asked me if I could introduce him to Gabor. Yeah. He's epic. I've had Gabor in here a couple times. Um, I was thinking actually he's, I, I was planning on reaching out to him cause I think he'd be a great person to include in this. Mm -hmm. Like the whole like movement conversation is just so much more than like the way that you literally, you know, doing exercises and stuff, but like the right. way that you feel and that, that sensation of, of, you know, not un, having that being in the realm of hungry ghosts and being mm. un, insatiable, uninsatiable, insatiable, in, in, insatiable? insatiable. Yeah. 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 It puts you into a contracted state. It's yeah. Like, yeah. I mean, and again, that, that's a very American value that it's very culturally inculcated in us to, you know, to admire someone who's never satisfied yeah. that that's considered admirable in America. Yeah. We admire sickness. Yeah. 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 And I've always, I, you know, from a very young age, I just, that, that never made sense to me. Like if you're not satisfied, then you're not happy. And if you're not happy, what's the fucking point? You're cultivating your own unhappiness. Who does that serve? You know, it serves the machine because it makes you run faster on that wheel. Right. You know, and that's getting back to your original question about the book. The, the main insight that I had that sort of sent me off on this wild tear that, um, you know, that I had to correct for later was around this question because I, I was doing research on what we consider to be successful people, right? The people who are yeah, seven, eight figure net worth living in a mansion overlooking the Pacific and, you know, start a, own a startup in Silicon Valley, you know, those people, the people, the, the cultural heroes that we yeah. all sort of wish we were supposedly. The people addicted to anti-anxieties and have the highest suicide rate. Right. The Tim Ferriss <laughs> crowd, people Tim Ferriss hangs out with. Yeah. It's like <laughs> they made it right. And then you actually look at them and they're miserable. Because the guy who lives down the street has, you know, 10 million more than him or, yep. you know, I've got a yacht, but he's got a plane and, you know, I've got a trophy wife, but he's got a harem. And it's just like, whatever, man, you're like, you're on the wheel. You're, you're climbing a mountain that has no top, you know, you'll never get there. Yep. And so my, my question, and I, I wrote this, there's a section in the book um, where I sort of pretend I've come up with a new psychological uh, disorder that will be in the next DSM. It's RAS, which stands for rich asshole syndrome. And, but I, I look at this research showing how rich people are unhappy. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I think the conventional wisdom on that is that assholes get rich because they're willing to do things that decent people wouldn't do. 
you know, the, to buy a company and fire everyone because then you can sell the the factories and make a profit and, you know, what this shit that um, Mitt Romney's company was doing for years. Um, but I think that, I'm sure that's true, there are a lot of uh, sociopaths among the uh, the 1%, but it's also true that people who get rich become miserable because it's not human. It's a very inhuman space to be in where you have much more opportunity than other people that's painful for everybody including the rich people yeah and you know i thought about the first time i went to india when i was very young i was like 26 or something i i went to india and i remember sitting in this restaurant and there were these there was a i was at a table outside and these children came running over and just stood there staring at my plate of food And eventually the waiter came out and shooed them away like they were flies or something. And, you know, I had been living in Manhattan before that. And, you know, the homeless in Manhattan, I just sort of was like, ah, they're, you know, you're a drug addict. You made bad decisions. You've ruined, you know, you fucked up yourself. It's not my problem. You know, I had all those little dialogues in my head. Um, or, you know, it's a mental health problem. The state should be taking care of it. Some hospitals should take care. I can't help, you know, whatever. But then in India, it was like, no, those people, they're not addicts. They're kids. They're not, it's not a mental health issue. It's not, there's no way to blame them for it. And it fucking broke my heart, man. And, and then I project that, like, how does it feel to have a shit ton of money and be a decent person and, and know that there are people all around who can't afford to, you know, get basic medicine for their kids. How do you deal with that? What do you do? Okay, maybe you give some money to a charity or something, but it doesn't matter. That suffering is still there. That that unfairness and injustice is still around you everywhere. And you can't do anything about it. You can't solve the problem. You give away everything, it's not going to solve the problem. It might solve your problem you know, of living with that discrepancy, but it doesn't solve the structural problem. So I, I have a lot of um, sympathy for, for wealthy people because everybody thinks they should be happy and they're not. And nobody wants to hear them complain about how hard it is to be a fucking millionaire, you know, yeah. but it is. So anyway, my point is that that insight I had was if the winners of the game aren't winning, who the fuck is winning? Because we know the losers aren't winning, aren't winning. The game of civilization. Who's winning? Like here, you and I are. We're sitting in fucking Santa Monica, one of the richest places in the world. Everybody's driving around in their BMWs, and you know we've got all our toys and our great weather and all that. And you know what's the sort of baseline level of happiness of people living in Santa Monica? I don't think it's high. I don't think it's higher than in Oaxaca or Chiapas. So what the fuck is the point then? Because we're the winners up here, right? I used to think, I used to think of life as like a, a game, like a poker game you play at your buddy's house, right? So if I show up, you know, I leave with $50 less than I came with. One of you guys got that $50, right? Somebody's leaving with 50 more somehow, right? But then I realized like, wait a minute. No, somehow we're all losing. Everybody at the table is losing. So who's winning? It's the house. We're not playing at a buddy's house. We're playing in a casino. That's why we're all losing, because we're in a casino. So who's the casino? It's not the Rockefellers. It's not Howard Hughes. It's not these miserable billionaires. They're as fucked. They're more fucked than anyone, right? Fucking Michael Jackson. And, you know, name a billionaire who's not crazy. Warren Buffett's probably the only one. There's definitely like a one-to-one connection of like the more famous and richer the person is as far as like the people that I come in contact with. They're not. Oftentimes the funnier they become. Funnier. (laughs) (laughs) But not humorous. Not humorous. (laughs) Um, Yeah. You got to go. Um, So... Oh, is it, is it that time? Probably. Oh, I don't know. Nah, that's all right. It's whatever, just whatever. my mom. She'll yeah. wait. <laughs> she just, she just came out She'll of her, her vagina. Um, so the the one thing that was interesting. How dare you mention my mom? <laughs> my mother doesn't have a As vagina. As I was saying it, I was trying to like whisper it out because I was like, no, don't say that. <laughs> too late. It was too late. I was already, already jumped off the edge. 
<laughs> with the there's a there's a study about uh, people playing Monopoly. Oh uh, yeah, I quote that in the book. That's oh, perfect. Uh, Dashel uh, at Berkeley. I forget. Yeah, Dashel something. He's got a funny it. weird name. Yeah, but yeah, but that's what we do. We do that that. Uh, well, you know the study. Yeah, so the study is they pick two students like uh, at random, and they agree to participate in this research, and they say, okay, you're going to play a game of Monopoly. So first, let's flip a coin to see who's go- who's the winner and who's the loser. Flip a coin. Okay, you're going to win. So you get two dice, and the other guy gets one dice, one die, and so you get to go, you know, you go much faster around the board, and every time you pass go, you get four hundred dollars and he only gets one hundred dollars and you start with a hotel on park place and boardwalk and you start with nothing and now play and so okay both people know that who's going to win and who's going to lose but they go through the motions of play and there are funny things like they put a bowl of pretzels near the table and the one who's winning eats more pretzels (laughs) and spills them on the floor and doesn't pick them up You know, and then so there are different behaviors that they exhibit and they're they get aggressive and they get like arrogant and then they interview them afterwards. And the winner will often say things like, you know, my strategy from the beginning was I was going to do this and that they they tell the story in which they won because they're better. Right, not because they're just start fucking. Off on third base. They start off yeah. on third base and <laughs> think they hit a triple. Exactly. Yeah. So uh, we do that. We tell these stories and we become assholes. They also show like wealthier people are much less adept at reading facial expressions. Right. They're they're literally unable to see the suffering of other people. You'd have to numb yourself to get to that point and not be suffering from it. That's the point. That's the point I was trying to make that they are in such distress that they shut down basic human functions in order to deaden themselves to that suffering around them and within them. And as we know that anytime you do that, you're, you're removing meaning and sensation and beauty from your life. You're removing friendships. You're removing, removing community, which is the one thing that has the strongest correlation with happiness and health and and longevity is just being feeling embedded in a sense of community. There's an 80 year old odd study about that. You're familiar with that one? Mm. Harvard study. It's like the oldest running study. So they they started off since they were like little guys, right? Like guys and girls. Right. And that was what they found. Now that people are all old, you know, 80 years old, wherever. Um, and they found that the people that had the strongest community ties were the healthiest, happiest, all that. Everything right. else was, was superfluous. Everything else is details, whether you smoke, yeah. drink, all that. Yeah. yeah um, well, you know, the country with the highest um, longevity in the world right now, as of this year, the World Health Organization just came out with a study. Somewhere, Scandinavia or something? Spain. Oh, good, yeah. My, where I live, right? Yeah, I felt and, that. And it was really funny because they said... They looked at three, they thought a lot of factors, but three major factors were uh, alcohol use, tobacco use, and diet. And they just said that, strangely, Spain scored really badly on alcohol and tobacco use, yeah. you know, but their diet was really good. And uh, yeah, because a lot of people, I mean, everybody drinks in Spain, like yeah. every day. And um, there's still a lot of tobacco use, but they have really healthy habits. Like they eat slowly Mm. and enjoy it. They enjoy food. Like you get a, you get a cheese sandwich in Spain. It's two pieces of good bread, good olive oil, and a slice of good cheese. That's it. No tomatoes, lettuce, onions, pickles, relish, special sauce. None of that shit. It's you you taste the cheese and you know what it tastes like? Mm. Fucking cheese. Mm. It tastes like cheese. You get a cheese sandwich in America. Who knows what the fuck it tastes like? (laughs) It's like it's some bread that got injected out of a fucking machine somewhere. You know, it's like Velveeta squirted. I mean, it's come on. I think a lot of the almost you could almost say smoking in our culture is 
almost a saving grace in some ways because it gets people to get out of the chair and walk outside. <laughs> and Seriously. a sense of community. You're with the other you're, smokers you're with outside. People, you're connecting. Yeah. yeah, yeah. You're making eye contact. You're right. Like we share this. Cer- like we, we don't have yeah. any ceremony in our culture. Yeah. It's just go to fucking work. Right. Get back. Put on Netflix. Right. You know, maybe drink alcohol, numb the whatever. And right. Then fall asleep. I need a beer. Yeah. <laughs> but I think that that's a huge thing. Like, like with the drinking of the alcohol in Spain, like the tapas and like that mm. whole culture, it's almost like the practice of taking life less seriously. Yeah. You know, where you come midday and you're like, yeah, we're drinking. Fuck it. You're like, oh, cool. Yeah. All right. But, you know, like your enigmatic line about an unhealthy connection or, you know, the obsession with life yeah. uh, or with death, aversion to death. Whatever. Um, <laughs> whatever it was. It was a good line. Whatever the fuck it was. Um, you know, you just said not taking life so seriously. But to me, that is taking life seriously. Right. Because you're fucking enjoying it. Yeah. So from an American perspective, yeah, I'm exactly. in Spain. I go out to lunch with my friends. We get a table outside. We drink a couple of bottles of wine. Lunch goes on a while. I don't get back to work till five o'clock. I'm kind of shit faced, but I'm happy. I don't get much work done. I go home at seven. And then I go out for my friends with dinner and we get to drink. That, from an American perspective, is like, you're not taking shit seriously. You're not taking your job seriously. Right. You're wasting your time, blah, blah, blah. But from a Spanish perspective, it's like, you're doing it right. What'd you do today? I had a long lunch, drank some really good wine, had a lot of laughs with my friends, ate some great food, sat in the sun, you know, then went back, punched in for an hour or two, and then went out and had dinner and had a good time. Like, that is life. That's it. That's the point. Yeah. It's we're not put on earth to make money for fucking Raytheon. <laughs> I don't know what that is. <laughs> <laughs> is that like a Bitcoin or something? Raytheon is yeah, like one Raytheon. of the biggest defense contractors. Oh shit. They make I need to learn. bombs and guidance systems and I shouldn't have said that out loud. That's they just they make the world go I... round. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. There's another there's another uh sorry for being so quotatious with studies, but there's another one in relation to drinking milkshakes or whatever. And they had two different types of milkshakes. And one, they told the uh, subjects that it was like, this had like all the fat and all the sugar and like everything super full. And the other one was like diet, nothing. Um, and then what they found is they had completely different physiological responses to the, to, to each. Mm. So if you think Based on that what you're drinking, a right. beer while you're doing the tapas in Spain, huh. you know, or out here where we think it's like this terrible thing and we feel guilty about it and we go in, mm. You know, so yeah. I think that there's, I think everything's way more magical than what we actually perceive it. Like mm. there's way more magic happening and that we have all these stories, which creates the magic yeah. and then we call it the thing and we give the thing all the credit. But yeah. in fact, it was actually your own internal, like yeah. fucking aqueous floating shit. Andrew Weil, <laughs> actually Andy Weil wrote about that in a, a book called The Natural Mind back in the seventies, where he argued that a lot of the the effects that we associate with different drugs are created by the brain. Mm -hmm. And so marijuana, for example, uh, you have to learn to get high. First few times you smoke, you don't feel anything. And that seems to suggest that it is an acquired, learned response. So you get physiological changes. You get the cotton mouth and dry eyes and maybe munchies or whatever. Um, But that sort of giggly high feeling, he argued, is produced by the brain as sort of a placebo response hmm. to the physiological changes associated with marijuana. Yeah, that's why I, th- I agree with a lot of when people feel like there's certain people that seem like they're continually kind of tripping, you know, like the like the the veil is a little bit thinner with them. Hmm. And oftentimes they're like, dude, I don't think I need psychedelics. And I'm like, I think you're right. Mm. Like, thank you. <laughs> you know, but for the people that the veil is really thick, the veil being like the tunnel that we live in. Then, from my perspective, I think it doesn't necessarily need to be psychedelics, but something that is a powerful phase shift is really is helpful for those people. If if they're stable, yeah, right. You know, the problem is people who are in a either just have a personality structure that isn't particularly stable, or who are in a phase of their lives where there's a lot of instability. I think. Um, those sorts of psychedelics or any disruptive experience can can be really traumatic. Yeah, it's like the rock. 
the rock could potentially explode if you shake it. No. <laughs> Probably, though. <no. laughs> yeah, it's like the rock. I don't think that guy should trip. I don't know. I don't want to be in the room when that guy eats mushrooms. But with, like, the anti-fragility. Like, the oh, rock, oh, right, if you shake right. it too much, it could potentially explode. But it'll break your damn box. It'll break the damn box. Yeah. You know, whereas if it's if the, the organism truly is anti-fragile, then you could take some right. mushroom or some right. workout or some exactly. breath or some sexuality or whatever, and it just, like, you go... You assimilate it. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, you're right. So there's like a middle ground there. It is like where, where yeah. things are, are, are helpful. Yeah. Yeah. I'm I'm a big fan of psychedelics in my own life. They've been very helpful and useful. Um but I I've learned to be cautious in recommending them to anybody without like yeah. really talking it through. Right. You know, because I've seen people have very difficult to, I've had very difficult times and uh, I've seen other people have very difficult times with them so you know but if you're doing that the thing to remember is that you'll always come out the other side like it's never what people really get hung up on is thinking they're going to be stuck there forever yeah. and that's not the way it is everything passes the challenging thing with suggesting or not suggesting is most so I've had some like really terrifying experiences in that way um and those have been really like shaping pivotal moments in my life in a way yeah you know so that's like yeah. there's so there's like oh like i wouldn't want yeah. to suggest so and i totally agree because i'm like oh god like just do your own research and feel what feels good for you right and those moments that i have been absolutely the most terrified like literally hiding under sheets hmm. <laughs> like i don't know what from exactly but like just hiding from myself or something hmm. Um, being able to work through that and like come into communion with nature and shit like that. Um, it was the most important, some of the most important moments in my life. Yeah. You know, so it's, it's a weird thing to. Yeah. I mean, people ask me if I ever had, you know, a bad trip and I tend to answer that I've had difficult trips, but never bad trips. Right because of that yeah. th that they were difficult and you know at the time I wasn't happy but in retrospect I learned something really important like not to take so much acid <laughs> <laughs> that's what I learned on the last one I, but, yeah, uh, I, I was reading Terrence McKenna <laughs> again, and there was all this shit about heroic doses, and I was like, yeah, I'm going to do a heroic dose. Uh, it's been a while, and yeah. yeah, I wasn't much of a hero. I, I ended up, I was like, you were hiding under sheets. I was hiding <laughs> under a rhododendron bush <laughs> and, on the grounds of a mental hospital. Oh, wow. Yeah, yeah. I, I sometimes imagine... Did you go to the mental hospital? No, I wandered onto it. I was I was wow, in this forest, and I had been, like, running around and crying, and, you know, I, there was I'd lost my shirt, and I, my body was all scratched because I'd been running through these bramble bushes, and, yeah, I thought a helicopter was chasing me. It was... It's a long story, but it was... Um, uh, yeah, so I was cowering under this rhododendron bush because I heard all these voices around me and I was like I did not want to run into anyone you know I was in no shape to exchange pleasantries with hikers right. but the voices were all like like weird kind of monstrous voices so I was just like fuck this and they were all around so I got into this bush and I was waiting and then I heard a woman calling names and then the voices started going moving away and so I came out and then I sort of parted these branches and looked and there was this big lawn and there was a nurse and these mental patients that had been out wandering around and she'd come out to like gather them up and take them back in hmm. and that's what I had heard thank god she didn't stumble on me or I'd probably still be there hmm. yeah there's a study uh you know since we're throwing around studies yeah. <laughs> there's a, a study years ago like maybe in the 70s or 80s where this um this teacher of psychiatry had his students check themselves into a mental health clinic uh, to a, a psychiatric hospital saying that they were hearing voices. Yeah. 
And then the the experiment was check yourself in, say you're hearing voices, and then the next day, get out. They weren't able to get out. They couldn't get out. <laughs> Because <laughs> nobody would believe them. They're like, no, 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 I'm fine. I'm right. fine. This is a study. I'm a medical student at Yale. This was a study to see. And they're like, yeah, okay, take your medication and go sit down over there. Don't make me call the orderly. Before you know it, you start maybe going crazy. Yeah. I told, I, I might have not told you. I went to, I've talked about it in like other podcasts. I don't know if I've actually talked to him about here, but um, I went to jail for like, I got like, multiple felony charges and shit. It was for, for cannabis. Wow. And, um, it was, everything was completely dropped and it was like, it wasn't my thing, but we were at this property and I was staying there for like a couple days. And during that time frame, there was Mexican cartel. They were growing like 7,000 plants that was infringing on this property. This guy that was growing like 99 plants or whatever. Anyways, <clears throat> everybody there ended up going to jail full on helicopter, like, you know, not swap or whatever. So they thought you guys were part of the cartel thing? Yeah. Uh -huh. So they treated me and the people there as though we were like cartel growing 7,000 plants. Wow. So full on like gun back of the head. I was on like a rock climbing trip heading to Canada <laughs> and um, I got like, you know, pulled out of my hammock and just the full on treatment. And then uh, during that time frame though, got like the Hannibal Lecter like shackles, you know, around the, the, the wrists and around the waist no and, your, shit. and your, your legs Fuck, and you're like getting shuffled dude. in and put you in the car and take you to this court to be tried um, for like the temporary thing and then your actual trials like yeah. six months later or something yeah. like that. And for it was, your arraignment. Yeah, I don't know what the terms yeah. are, but yeah, but, but super, super fascinating experience. It was just like that psychology experiment thing um, because when you're wearing the stripes... And you got the Hannibal Lecter shackles around. Yeah. And you have all of like, the, yeah. the good straight people looking at you and the judge. And you're like, I'm a fucking criminal. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, sure. You, know, you put yourself in that environment. It's like the Stanford prison oh, experiments. Yeah. yeah. Although Prisoners start to become that's been debunked. Huh? Yeah, oh, I, yeah. I write about that in Civilized to Death. That and also the uh, Milgram experiment with the... Uh, where he claimed that he convinced people to torture other people. Oh. You know? It sounded a little fishy. I'm like, really? I don't think I would... If I was the prison... I'm right. like, I wouldn't be beating anybody personally. Right. But of yeah. course you'd think that. Yeah, yeah. And that's what was so pernicious about it because everyone was like, I wouldn't do that. But the point of the experiment is that it shows that you probably would do that. Right. Um, but then when you actually l dig into the papers and look at what's come out in the last few years about both of those experiments, turns out that most people didn't participate. Hmm. Most people refused to do that shit. Oh. And in fact, the people who were most likely to hurt the other people were the good people, the students who did got straight A's, who yeah, respect authority. Yeah. Yeah. Same things happens with, with drivers in cars when they put people in, in larger seats so you can open up your posture. You're more likely to um, like double park and, you know. Oh, really? Yeah, because you own the road. Oh. Well, getting back to that uh, <laughs> Dashiell, uh, what's his name up at Berkeley, he did a study where he put a, an old lady at a crosswalk and monitored which cars stopped for her and which didn't. And the more expensive the car was, the less likely it was oh, to yeah. stop and you let her cross. Yeah. You know the car's going to pick you up. It's going to be Volkswagen the, it's gonna be, yeah, bus. It's gonna be the, yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's going to be the truck with like, you know, four guys already packed into it. Yeah, like, yeah. One of the wheels is rolling yeah, off. You're like, yeah. got my ride. <laughs> We're going. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. It's not the rich people. Nobody's stopping for you in a Lexus. It's because they have something to protect. And yeah. the more you have to protect, the more you go into a contracted place. And the more right. contracted you are, the more like depressed. Right. I think. Right. Yeah. 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 That's true. All right, I'm going to go help my mom with her phone. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thanks. I did, did, it, did I answer? Uh, uh, yeah, did you so have the way, questions so the you wanted? Gonna, well, no. I mean, the, the way it's going to be is essentially like in each chapter, I'm going to have people that I think are influential in my world and this world and all that. Mm. Um, and have, it'll be like a few like bullet points or kind of, I don't know. Uh, we'll okay. see. I need to talk to right. the, the, the publishers and see what they think right. is like good. Right. Um, but yeah, I think it'll be a really cool thing. Cool. But the, yeah, the big yeah. thing is just like, the conversation around whole civilized to death stuff. Mm. Cause that's like the, I don't know what I'm going to call a chapter exactly. Like caveman to modern man or something. I don't know, mm. whatever, but mm. that, that part, the civilization, how it affects us. It'll be right. Like, right. Anyways. Cool. Thanks, well, man. Yeah. What's the, um, 
how can we refer people to tangentially speaking? What's the, what do you point people to? What's like your preferred? Yeah. Tangentially speaking is my podcast and cool. that's the, my main gig these days. Yeah. Sweet. When's the book come out? Uh, probably, I don't know. Fall. Great. Uh, of 2019. Cool. Yeah. Yeah. Sweet. All right. Thanks. Thank you, man. It's fun. Appreciate it. Boom. Over and out. Wow. Thank you so much for tuning in that conversation. I hope you enjoyed it as much as I did. Uh, we've got a couple things to help support that body of yours. One of which is the Align Band that people have been really loving, which I'm super grateful for. Um, it is a heavy-duty resistance band. comes along with a door anchor, traveling case, and then a online video guide on how to use that thing. It's my absolute go-to travel tool. I've got it hanging literally from my door right beside me now. Um, use it regularly. Use it with clients. Uh, it can be found at alignpodcast.com slash gear. Uh, on Amazon, and you can also find it at Line Band on Instagram. Um, also, we finally did it. We created the Align Method online program, which focuses on unwinding the patterns of staring into technology, essentially. So forward head posture, rolled forward shoulders, rolled forward spine, kind of like just that hunchy posture thing that um, modern world is is stricken by uh, gets into how to align your physical body. So self-care, joint by joint, from ankle to knee to hip to spine to head to neck, etc. Really good stuff. Also gets into lifestyle, um, gets into morning routines, nighttime routines, how to effectively handstand, how to move on the ground. Um, people have been loving that. Thank you all for grabbing it, the ones that have. And if people have any questions about that, you can reach out at Align Podcast on Instagram. I'm happy to support. All right. Thank you, guys. Enjoy your day. Thanks for joining you. Thanks for telling your friends. Thanks for reviews on iTunes. That's it. Pow.